I'm thinking about the policy implications before anyone else. I think, as I, I was saying, it looks, from what I hear with the Fed, for about four months, they were just stunned. They didn't really know what to do. The UK was forced to start thinking very early about what to actually do. They introduced the Banking Act quite early on, and they had to start developing more policy responses. On the other hand, the other thing the crisis probably revealed, but this was quite controversial, was that the UK banking system in general, not just Northern Rock, was going to be pretty vulnerable to this sort of crisis. But that was one of the issues that was unclear. The government's position was very much, this was just a one-off. This is just this one bank in trouble. We're sorting it out. Now, it did have another effect, which was the government, because of this crisis, didn't call an early general election which Gordon Brown probably would have won. Now, if Gordon Brown's facing an election, which I'm almost certain Labour's going to lose, or there's a quite, a, at least according to the polls, there's quite a strong chance they will. At that time, Gordon Brown had just taken over. It was a new regime. But because of this crisis and the perceived mishandling or difficult handling of it, he was more reluctant to call a general election, which he had been threatening to call in October 2007. And indeed, with Northern Rock, the government took a very long time to realize that they were going to have to nationalize this bank, that no one was going to buy it in the current circumstances. Um, and that took a lot of the policy space, a lot of the discussion for the UK, the first part of this crisis. There was about four or five months where the government was still convinced they were going to be selling off Northern Rock. They weren't going to nationalize it. Ultimately, in February, they did have to nationalize it. And it's still probably the biggest single cost for the UK government is the Northern Rock. Now, the second bit of the crisis I want to talk about is really the bit that uh, Jacob was talking about, was this period I call the interregnum. How do we understand what was happening to the system in the period after August 2007, when credit markets seized up, but the stock market still kept going up and up? What did this mean? And indeed, with the stock market going up, British banks continued to pursue their expansionary plans. Royal Bank of Scotland, Barclays, were still bidding up the price of ABN Ambro in this period, trying to take over a rival bank. It turned out the bank that won that auction, RBS, more or less ruined itself with that bid and, and was eventually taken over, essentially, by the UK government. But there was an increasing distress in the banking system. It was clear. And at the same time, there was an increasing set of denials by the banks in the public. Now, I think the BBC, I mean, there was quite a debate within the British press about this. And the Financial Times was more optimistic, I'd say, generally. The BBC was more pessimistic about how serious this was. And there was quite a debate in the press about what did this all mean. And I think the optimists thought, as some people in the government thought, these markets can't stay frozen forever. What does it mean? How could a huge credit market, $4 trillion market, freeze up? And some of us were saying, well, there's no evidence it, it is opening up, and the distress, if this market stays frozen, the distress, this is going to cause the banking system, and therefore, ultimately, the economy is going to be very big. Now, how did I form a view on this? I mean, this is, well, I'll just tell a little bit of the personal side. I mean, I was, one of the issues that people in the UK were very unclear on is why should subprime problems in the US affect Europe and the UK that much? No one was really clear on how deeply the UK and European banks were involved in this and how much they had actually bought. And of course, they weren't about to tell us. So one of the interesting things I find in this crisis, and I'd say is characteristic as a journalist crisis, is that the people who deny things most strongly, this is going to get Jacob's point, the people who do call you up are often the people in the deepest trouble. So in the course of this six months, when we were raising all the problems, I got calls from all the Scottish banks, RBS, HBOS, to deny that we should ever put them on any list of exposure to subprime mortgages. They had no subprime problems. They had no US exposure. And we were very wrong. How dare we even suggest that they had any sort of securities that were any risk at all? The other people who called me up, interestingly, from the States, were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Whenever we wrote a story about them, they called up and said, we have no subprime exposure. Why are you putting us in this category of toxic assets? We're strong. We, we aren't allowed to lend to any, anything risky at all. So some of the people who were the biggest victims were the people who were calling, without me even calling them, when I wrote an article about them saying, 
you put us in a category with the wrong people. You've misunderstood completely. We have no risk. We have no exposure. It's very interesting. The other thing that I think made me realize the seriousness of this crisis was going to the US. Just after this, in September, October, I took a trip to the US because I was very skeptical of this argument that this is just subprime. It's nothing. It's, it's just a sort of obscure problem you know, affecting a few Midwestern cities. So I went to Cleveland to look at subprime mortgages on the ground. I went to Washington to talk to people there. I went to New York. But I think the meeting that, for me, brought this home to me more than anything else was going to the international bankers meeting at the IMF. You know, the IMF has two meetings a year. And the international bankers, they call themselves the Institute for International Finance, have their own side meeting at the, uh, at the IMF meeting. Now, usually it's a bit of a love fest where everyone is extolling the virtues of international banking and how much they're contributing. But going to this meeting in Washington in Oct early October 2007, I've never seen so much panic and fear on the face of central bankers. I mean, remember the head of Paribas getting up and saying, we didn't really realize that the US didn't regulate the mortgage securities market and that these subprime mortgages were being written, underwritten without you know, any supervision. And you could just see on their faces and the way they reacted that something much more serious was going on, even though publicly you know, they couldn't actually admit the size of the figure. So that was, I think, a very strong clue. The other thing was to just see on the ground in Cleveland how much damage there was. And if you go to a, any of the big northern cities, there were sways. I mean, there are sways of neighborhoods that were just completely wiped out. This is a picture I shot in Cleveland. There were, you just go, and there are thousands of houses that were essentially been repossessed, could not be resold, and were now derelict. And people just went around stripping all the copper, and that's why these houses are derelict. They take out all the siding, the copper, and sell it. And the whole neighborhood, once you get enough houses like this, the house prices in that neighborhood just go to zero, essentially. So absolute devastation, huge economic impact. That's not just going to you know, be a small event. It's, it's kind of you know, a whole section of a city that's basically you know, disappeared, the, the housing values in that. These weren't the, the poorest areas. This is the thing. These were the areas where people had actually had some money enough to become homeowners. These were the black areas where people had steady jobs and saved all their lives to buy a small house and had been convinced to remortgage on the grounds that there was a lot of free money around. If you just remortgage, you could pay off your medical bills, have that car, help your children through college. But seeing that devastation and also seeing the panic on the face of bankers, I was convinced that something much more serious was going on. What was interesting was, again, in this period, the very mixed messages that we were getting. As I say, the banks were completely denying there was any problem publicly, trying to resist that. The UK government uh, and many policymakers were also denying that this crisis was permanent or serious. So I remember having conversations again with the Bank of England deputy governor, saying, well, we've rescued the banks already. What more do they want? <laughs> and this was in January 2008. And the other, I mean, the curious thing about that IMF meeting was the official forecast of the IMF was still at that time, even October 2007, for robust growth or very moderate effect. And what we did see then, and I, and I suppose from our point of view, what we could use to move the story on was increasingly negative estimates from both the OECD and the IMF about the impact of the crisis and from some private people like Mark Zandi was another person who was sort of talking about the scale of this. And I think, again, the first meeting after I came back from this, um, this trip to the US in, in the BBC office, when I started giving some numbers and I said, well, a rough estimate of the size of the damage so far is $1 trillion. That's the size of the subprime market that's now closed. And that's a pretty big hit for the banking sector to take. That's more than a year's profits. And people didn't really believe this number. They didn't think it could possibly be that big. Now, as I was saying, in the UK, there is a real state of denial. And this is one of the other issues of the crisis for the BBC, because we have, if you remember, both a UK side. Domestic, we're doing domestic news. We're also doing world news. We're in the same office. And there's very much this belief that, OK, there's a bad crisis in the US. We don't know how bad. But it's not really going to be 
hitting the UK 